Welcome everyone, I'm Marie Manucheri. We are so glad you are joining us. I'm very excited to introduce our special guest today, Dr. Mario Martinez. Dr. Mario Martinez is a clinical neuropsychologist who lectures worldwide on how cultural beliefs affect health and longevity. He is founder of Biocognitive Science, a new paradigm that investigates the causes of health and the learning of illness in cultural context. It's a pleasure to have you, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited about the topic. Me, me too. I'm very excited <laughs> about the topic. I mean, I, I love anything to do with science. And then you add in awareness and consciousness and growth and expansion, and I'm sold. Uh, so this is very exciting. What new paradigm are you bringing to mind-body science? What I'm, what I'm bringing in is uh, it, it, there's no question that mind and body communicate with each other. You have to be in a cave to believe that it doesn't. But the, what I'm bringing in is that it communicates in a cultural context. So I'm bringing culture. And the brain is cultural. The immune system had to learn to be cultural. The nervous system had to learn to be cultural. And the endocrine system. So basically, it's mind-body culture. And the culture is really the, um, it's the fabric that we weave around the world that we collectively believe in a group. And that's what our biology will respond to. There's no objective world out there. So for example, the only way that we can see the world is between infrared and, and uh, um, uh, ultraviolet. That's it. Uh, that's uh, the, But that's not the world. A bee only sees uh, in, uh, the ultraviolet. A, uh, sna a snake sees uh, infrared. And a bat doesn't see anything. They have sound waves. So it depends on the, the apparatus that you have. And based on that, we're the only being that weaves a culture around our, our, our sensations. So our biology responds to the cultural beliefs that we have, in, in, including longevity, as you know from the course that I taught on longevity. So that's basically it. What I'm bringing in is a cultural component to cultural neuroscience and cultural psychonominology. And, and what you believe in obviously affects your cells and your DNA and oh, yes. your organs, everything, yes. which finally modern science is starting to get a glimpse of that, you know, in um, some of the new cancer research that are doing, creating, you know, proteins that are based on each individual. So it makes yes. total sense to me that, you know, how you use your intuition, your insight, your awareness, how you age has everything to do with what you heard, saw and felt and were taught um, within your community, um, and that all of that just goes deep into your body system. That's very amazing. So how does the brain become cultural? When you think about, uh, I don't think you're going to hear this anywhere, anywhere, so this is good. It's a good question. We have been homo sapiens for 150,000 years, but we didn't have language till about maybe 40,000 years ago or consciousness. Consciousness came when we started burying our dead and especially when we buried our dead with trinkets that belong to them. That requires a tremendous amount of abstraction neuropsychologically to be able to do that. But then we had grunts and sounds to uh, express danger, to express uh, sexual interest, whatever, but that was it. It had very little meaning. So before you had to go by the senses. The, the senses were very epigenetically transferred. You could smell a lion 100 feet away, 200 feet away, and that's what that was the indicator. But then language comes up and then language says there's a lion 100 feet away. So the brain had to learn to transfer some sensations to language and it became biosymbolic. Language became biosymbolic. So then the immune system had to get used to the brain saying, hey, there's a lion there. As before, I can smell the lion. So, so our, we are biosymbolic. This is why words hurt. If you shame somebody, you have molecules of inflammation. If you make somebody smile, you have oxytocin. If you get somebody excited about a new idea, you have dopamine. So it's the words that are now biosymbolic, like the senses used to be. Would it be in our best interest to start going back to those senses and incorporating that into our consciousness as well? Well, that's to incorporate them. That's what intuition is, to incorporate the biosymbols with the senses. But a sixth sense, which is... Uh, that sense of, of intu intuition. Um, but intuition, if we're going to talk about it, it's really basically, it's an immediate understanding or a knowing of something without reasoning. You don't go, okay, let me see. Oh, I can intuit. Forget it. That's left brain. That doesn't work. So what we're going to talk about is 
how that happens and how can we learn it and how could we incorporate it, but a little bit of science behind it so you can see where it comes from. Oh, that sounds absolutely fantastic. Um, why do you argue that culture is more important than genes and health and longevity? Because I think that, that the causes of health are inherited and longevity is learned. So epigenetics is a transfer of information that affects our gene expression from the environment, from our words, from what we do. We transfer that, not DNA, but we transfer it in the expression of the genes in the chromosomes. So we transfer that. And what we're transferring is a cultural belief. And that cultural belief is more powerful than the genes. This is why in the research that I did with uh, centenarians, it's only 20% uh, genetics. The rest is biosymbolic. The rest of the culture beliefs that they have. So your culture will kill you before your genes, but your, your culture will also heal you faster than your genes because it's the, the bioinformational field that you create. If, if somebody loves you, you're going to feel psychoimmunologically very healthy if you believe it. If you don't believe it, thousands of people could love you and you're not going to have any benefit from it. And that kind of emotional, genetic, epigenetic expression passes on to another generation. I've, I've treated patients who, have, who were uh, probably third generation or fourth generation from the Auschwitz uh, camps of uh, concentration camps, and they pass on a high level of cortisol, even though they're no longer in, in, the, uh, in those places. But you also passes on high levels of uh, emotional uh, things that you can do to, to, to trigger the cultural uh, things that you transfer. You, you, you transfer the cultural propensities for health and the cultural propensities for illness, and they call them family illness. Family illness is not a, a certainty. It's a propensity that can be triggered or not, depending on how you live and the beliefs that you have and so forth. Yeah, I have ha had several clients who had horrific you know, aspects of stress and anxiety because of the genetics um, that was taught to them from the experiences that they're Epigenetically, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, and so unlearning that and unwrapping that and dissolving that and recognizing that we don't have to respond just because our great grandparents did or our grandparents. Yeah, sure, it has to be a, a different habits. process, yes. Do you think that we're having a shift in culture because we do seem to be living longer and more in a healthy way than we have, you know, years past? Do you think we're having a shift in culture? I think so. I think what we're having is the fourth revolution, I think. The, the first revolution was agrarian. It lasted 10,000 years and it went all and, and the power was in the land. That's why there were slaves. The power was in the land. The more land, the more power. But then the steam engine comes up and then you have the locomotive and you and then you have the printing press. And so then the industrial age comes in around the late uh, 18th century. And then bricks and mortars were the power. That's the power. So the more bricks and mortars, are, that's where you had the, uh, the, the big corporations and uh, the, the more production about production. Then in the 50s, the computer and commercial flying so then comes the information revolution. This is why Steve Jobs could beat IBM from his uh, garage. You couldn't do that before. So information is the power then. But then we have all of that. We have production, we have agriculture, we have information, but meaning is what's lacking. So the fourth generation, I think, is a generation of meaning. And you think that's what's helping us to live longer? I think so. I think so because you, you, centenarians don't live just to live. They have a lot of meaning in their lives. They think that they're going to be around forever. They think everybody loves them. So they have a way of looking at the world that actually is immunologically very powerful. Speaking of power, what are the precursors for belongingness and connectedness? Okay, well, I'll, let, me, let me give you a little bit of a run on this, and then I'll go to that part because that's, that's the part that's so important for the intuition. But the idea of intuition is that we have something that comes to us that's not rational, that it's not a, 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 a sequential process where you get a sense of something and you don't know where it's coming from. Well, the brain, first, the brain has 86 billion neurons, the nerve cells that, that, are, that are communicating with each other. 
the gut has about 500 million neurons. This is why a lot of people say I couldn't stomach that or my, my gut level. And the heart has about 40,000 neurons. They have neurons too. So all of those things coming together work to give you what we call intuition. So for example, people will say, she broke his heart, he broke her heart, my heart's not in it, I can't stomach that. Those are literal descriptions of something that's going on with your neurons. The heart especially, now there's a, there's a syndrome, they, they call it the broken heart syndrome. The, uh, the Japanese, uh, Takotsubo, the left ventricle that pumps the, the blood, so it's, 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 uh, it loses the power and it becomes, it looks like a, uh, a trap for, uh, uh, for um, uh, octopus, and that's why they call it takotsubo, that's the trap. And, and it, instead of being like this, it goes like this for a period of time because you have a broken heart. The heart can pick up information faster than the brain. When you show very fast pictures of uh, catastrophic kinds of things, the heart will will trigger the information before the brain before the brain does. So all of that is information that it is beyond the reasoning part, and we know that intuition comes from the from the right side of the brain. And uh, people say women have more intuition, and and and, and in general, I, I think that's right. But what's happening? Women have the, the corpus callosum is that that thick uh, fiber between the right and left hemisphere. Women have thicker fibers than men, so that they process information faster from one, from the intuitive to the language. Gray matter, women have more gray matter than, than white matter. Men have more white matter. Gray matter is the one that processes the information. The white matter is the channeling of the information. So those are precursors. Those are things that are there. And it doesn't mean every woman, but in general, in general, there are exceptions like everything else. So then, Let's go to the to the Spider Man. <laughs> yeah, I'm so curious about Spider Man because you brought okay. it up before we yes. uh, you know, went live, and I'm so excited. You've been people say you go from neuropsychology to crazy things, but pr- trust me, I'll come back. Spider Man. The idea is that that he was bitten by a spider, and he was in a coma for a while. But when he woke up, he had a sixth sense, and that sixth sense gave him an intuition to danger. That actually you could intuit danger and they call it a uh, spidey sense. So spidey sense, all right, well, spiders, the spiders have eight eyes and, and their brain is, it, it's, it, imagine the thorax, you don't have a head, you have a thorax, and in the thorax you have the brain and on top of the brain is the gut, gut communication with brain. So they, they, have, they can sense wind change, they can sense sound, they can sense, you notice that you touch a, a web and, and they move, powerful. So then guess who's studying the uh, uh, spidey sense? The US Navy and teaching Marines how to detect uh, danger intuitively. And they need that anyway. They need right? that, they need we that. We all need that. When the Dalai Lama left uh, Tibet because of the Chinese invasion in 1959, he led his people with remote uh, viewing and intuition, he would say, no, we can't go this way because there's a, there's a patrol of, of Chinese soldiers here, let's go this way. That's how they got out of uh, Tibet with that. So that those things can be taught, that can be taught, but you have to be aware of where it's coming from so then you can, you can practice it. So for example, if you are going to intuit something that you have a lot of knowledge, it's not gonna be processed so much by, by, the, by the intelligent part, it's gonna be going by the emotions because you already have the intelligence. If you don't have a lot of knowledge, it's going to go through the intellectual. It's going to take longer to intuit. And most medicine is intuitive. Medicine has, it's very technical, but well, doctors say, no, I don't think you should do this. And they don't know. But there's an intuitive process because of the the expertise that they have. And then they run it through the the gut or the heart. And then the information comes out. X-ray radiologists, you look at, you you look at, uh, they look like shadows. Oh, no, wait a minute, there's a tumor here. And this is a type of tumor because of that. That's intuitive. That's not, they're not saying, let me think. That's an intuitive process. Oh, I know. And I've met many radiologists and I always tell people they are very intuitive people, whether they recognize it or not. Yes. A and friend I- of mine is a, is a radiologist. We were driving around and he, he said, did you notice the, the deer on the right? I said, no. He said, he said there, were, there were nine deers. And I looked and it's, it's like nothing. So uh, that's 
intuitive. And, and the equivalent of, of the X-ray uh, technology is what they call the chicken sexers. In, in some Asian countries, when you have the chicks, you, it, you wanna have, you know which is the hen and which is a rooster. So what they do is they put them through a conveyor belt and they look them, they turn them up and they say, male, female, and all you see is feathers. <laughs> that's amazing. So, that's amazing. So that's kind of the the overall idea, and then we can get into the other things that that you were talking about, though. Okay, and and so what can someone do? You know, have you mapped out what different cultures, perhaps, uh, what would inspire their intuition, or what potentially um, holds back their insight? Has that been a part of your research? Yes, the, the, they're cultures that are basically survival. They, they're into survival. So the intuition has to be specialized just like anything else. So they become specialists at surviving at picking up the amygdala, the part of the brain that looks at danger. And, and that's what they're trying to teach in the, uh, the spidey sense of with the Marines. So, but, but then there are others that, that are, that go beyond survival and they go into meaning. So then they look at, uh, for example, um, there's a test in psychology that, that they, they, they um, show very fast images of people's faces, and you have to identify um, the, the, the emotion. This is uh, happy, sad, angry, surprised, and people get about 60%. The Tibetan Lamas who are taught empathy, they pick up 90%. Wow. Because they're able to see the, 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 the emotions immediately. That's intuitive. That's a, pre, that's a precognition. And, and then to your question now to, to the uh, glimpses of meaning, the glimpses of meaning as the precursors of, of, uh, of intuition. And what they are is that if you see something, if you see a pattern of something that other people aren't seeing, pay attention to that. And, and don't say, oh, I'm going to, and the moment you try to understand it, you go into linear and you're done. You let it go and you let the intuition process and come and say, oh, so this is what needs to happen. They do it, people that are really intuitive in the stock market, Einstein, in, in all fields. Einstein uh, came up with a law of relativity from a dream where he was driving, a, a, he was um, riding an, a rainbow. And now what's the, what's the logic? And there's no logic. So you, you can develop that. And when you look for those patterns and you begin to get a sense of, oh, here's the information, what happens is you you get a connection of belongingness mm -hmm. and, and a sense of connectedness. So it's really powerful for your immune system when you have those intuitions. Right. Do you think it would be helpful for you know individuals to maybe when they look at their friends or family without a conversation, like, are you sad? Are you happy? You know, to kind of get an idea to move in that space of empathy and started to connect to what's going on with someone emotionally. I mean, first try to fill it out and then maybe ask their friends and family members so that they can work on, you know, developing that skill set. Yes. And that reminds me, uh, you brought this up because it reminds me of, they call it the honeymoon effect. When people are in love and they, they, they finish each other's sentences, they've been tested. Psychologists like to test everything. So they have a seat, they, they have a, a, a desk uh, across from each other and then they have a barrier. So they give one of the partners a piece of paper and they ask them to draw something. They draw uh, a circle, 90% the partner gets a circle. After their first fight, it's gone. <laughs> so that's about the family thing that you can. right then you have to really work at it yeah empathy would be the the vehicle for this developing empathy the vehicle for for the intuition because I mean, it's very difficult unless you want intuition about danger with with emotional vampires you want intuition about danger you want right. to be able to pick up that this is not good for me right Right. And the patterns, I always think of it as it's kind of artistic, the way people pick up on patterns. It must be like how artists experience the world. They see the world very differently because the patterns aren't super obvious. And yet, perhaps if, if someone quiets their mind often and moves into the present moment, you know, continuously throughout the day, they could recognize the patterns that appear, you know, constantly all around us. Yes. And that's that's what radiologists are trained to look at patterns. So we can train ourselves to look at patterns outside in the world. And, uh, but also sometimes 
one way to know that you need to go into intuition when you push and push and push something and it's not going anywhere. You got to stop. The rational mind's not taking you anywhere. Stop, give it a break and let it uh, congeal. Let it uh, surface on its own. And all of a sudden you get some insights. But there's some techniques that you can use that I'll talk about in a few minutes that uh, actually uh, between Tibetan Buddhism and, and clinical neuropsychology. <laughs> I'm excited. I can't wait. Sounds amazing. Uh, so um, what are the glimpses of meaning in the terrain of intuition? In the, the, the glimpses of meaning is that you know there's something important, but you can't decipher it. You know there's something there and it touches you or, or, or gets your attention and you can't decipher it. If you try to decipher it, it loses. It loses the intuitive meaning. You might give it an intellectual meaning, but it has nothing to do with intuition. So those are glimpses that are there. And you can actually cultivate them or not. So you cultivate the, the glimpses of meaning. They're all over, all over the place. Every day you get glimpses of meaning. But you don't want to be intuitive all the time because you need the left brain. Intuitive, you want to be intuitive by, for survival and for meaning. Survival, very important. And for meaning, for life, for the meaning of life. You meet somebody, for example. You want a relationship and you meet somebody. And you get all excited and, and immediately what we do is we, and we put in all our expectations on the person, whether they are that or not. I want somebody who's honest, somebody who's there, somebody that, and the person might be a sociopath. But you put that on and you act as if that person is that. Instead of looking for patterns in that person and see what you pick up, see what it is that you get. And then process it and test it. Because intuition, some, after you get it, you can test the value of the intuition. So right. it's really good. It's good information because you can actually I get a sense about this. Let me check it out and see if, and, and you might see that you were absolutely right or you were wrong. Right, because intuition, once you hit onto the intuitive answer or solution or the, the pattern, the universe starts to let you know that you're on the right track, starts to just add more synchronicities in knowledge into your daily experience over and over and over and over and over again. The trick is, is not to analyze it because then right. you go into left brain. So right. you, you get an intuition and, and you let it surface. You let it hit you over the head with the clarity. Yes. If it's not clear, let it go. Let's let it happen because we have a tendency to want to understand things. And intuition is not understanding, it's intuiting. Right. So you want to be able to actually feel comfortable intuiting whatever it is and letting it surface. But sometimes we have to make a decision. And, and that, the, the key is that after you run all the intellectual process through, that's all you can do. Then try to go to intuition. But the most important thing is that never blame yourself or anybody for whatever decision was made. You have to own it. I intuited this and it didn't work. I own it. So what does that mean? I never do it again? No, I do it more intuitively <laughs> right okay. yeah, it's a practice it's a practice for yeah. sure it's, it's like practice. for example um there, there's a, a procedural learning i'm doing this now i don't tell my hand go here go there that's that's a procedural process when you learn to ride a bike once you have balance you don't say well let me go to the it's there intuition is that way too i love that i love that our biological response to our biology response to cultural fabric we weave to understand our world. Could you explain a little bit about that? Yes. When I, what I was saying about the, uh, the fabric that we create about the world is that we create a fabric based on our, on our models, father, mother, uncle, whatever the, the model. Oh, so this is a man. Oh, so this is a woman. So this is an uncle. And, and so this is good. So this is bad. So this is danger. So this is good. And then we, because of the connection that we have with, with the collective, we then create a world that makes assumptions and says, the world is good, the world is bad, the world is fair, the world is unfair. And, and then your biology has to respond to that, to the as if world that you create. So let's say you have a, a biology that says uh, the world is dangerous and it was dangerous when you were growing up. Then what happens is that the brain, any, anything that you repeat, the brain sees as survival, that it has to have survival. So if you repeat the world is bad, then the cognition 
tries to bring meaning to rationalize what the brain is doing. So it says, yes, the world is bad. Look, uh, there was a rape in Afghanistan. The world is bad. Or there was a there was a hurricane in Florida. The world is bad. So you confirm, and it's very hard to get out of that loop unless you stop and you say, I learned this. And anything that I learned, I unlearned. So let me see if I can find something that tells me that the world is not as bad as I think. But the brain needs evidence. You can't just think it through and say, um, Pollyanna, everything's beautiful. The brain needs evidence. So the evidence would be, today I found something good. And at first it might be, oh, it's just a coincidence. It's just a, no such thing. And, uh, and then gradually as you begin to counteract that belief system, your default mode of the brain begins to change. Default mode is like the, the goggles that you use to look at the world. This is why if you have the wrong goggles, you can meditate, you can do Om Mani Padme Om, you can do and 10 minutes later, you're back into alarm because the goggles come back. And do you rec- recommend meditation to assist in connecting to that beautiful fabric of knowingness? Yes, but I, I think a, me- a meditation that is contemplative. So that, and I use a, a technique that I call the, the, uh, the theater of change. And then there I use First, relaxing the body, then going to one point of meditation, then going to contemplative, and then going to the theater of change. And that's where we make the changes. Oh. Because if I if I tell you, look, you shouldn't be sad today. Look what a beautiful day. You're not going to say, oh, thank you. I feel so much better now. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So it, ha- it requires mind-body disembodying of the, of the old and re-embodying the new and then practicing it so you can create the neurons that are necessary. So let's say an affirmation, you have an affirmation and you say, I'm a good person. It's not going to work because the brain immediately is going to bring you evidence to counteract that. But if you say, I'm a good person, let me go to evidence in my archives when I was a good person and you embody that, then the neurotransmitters and everything of that time come back. It's like you're bringing the past to to the present and then you practice, I'm a good person for a week and the neural maps begin to change. I am a good person. Then, then the affirmation says, I'm a good person. Yes, here's the evidence. Wow. So you could even say that uh, I'm a, a good intuitive or I'm, I'm good right. at connecting the, the, the That's glimpses. right. That's a brilliant statement because if, I, if you say I'm an intuitive, well, show me. When were you an intuitive? Yesterday, two days ago. But the key is that you have to embody it. You can't just think it. I remember I was yesterday I was intuitive. I knew that I shouldn't have eaten that. And finally, and later I found out that it was poison. Okay, how does that feel? You, you embody it. Then yes, then you you build the intuition that way too. Oh, I love that. I, I, I think that is incredible. I, I wanted to know if you have any classes coming up or workshops or anything you want to share with us um, while we have you here. Well, yes, uh, I have the the course that I did with, uh, with uh, Shift. Uh, on longevity, it's already now on uh, on demand. That's available, and then I do monthly um, webinars. I call the Healing the Wounded Hero on my website, uh, and it's about we all have wounds, but we're not victims. We're wounded heroes. So each month is a new topic and something new. We do techniques, and the groups are small, so we can have a lot of uh, interaction. And that's my website, biocognitive.com, and of course my books, the Mind Body Code and Mind Body Self, and all that. So it's quite a bit of information and especially free information on YouTube. I have over 200 videos on YouTube, uh, Dr. Mario Martinez. I watched some of those. They're lovely. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yes. And this would be a good time um, if there's something you want to share with our listeners, anything that you would like to quickly share that could um, that they could take away from today, something very important perhaps, um, based on everything that we've talked about, is there something that you could leave as a wonderful tip for them. Yes, um, the, the thinking is that everybody is an intuitive and you just have to cultivate it. So the first thing that you have to look at is what or who taught you that intuition is some kind of magic or something that has nothing to do with, with the real life and real science, because that will be an obstruction. Who did you know in your family that was intuitive and how did they do things as evidence that you bring it back? And then third, when was I intuitive that really got me out of something really bad or into something really good? And then you embody that. And what's happening is you're beginning to practice your intuition. And you can be either what I call a scientific mystic or a mystical scientist. 
So for example, Einstein was a scientific, a, a mystical scientist, but Buddha, scientific mystic. And, and the, the difference is, you, and, and that's all you are as a, as, a, as a seeker, that you can only be those things. If you're a scientist and you go to the mystical to get information, that's, that's a mystical scientist. But if you're a mystic and you go to science to get more information, then it's the opposite. So ask yourself, which one are you? And then cultivate that, and that will bring you a tremendous amount of intuition. I, I love these tips. Can you be both of those things? You know, like well, one at day times, you yeah. are, and at the times, next yeah. day or something else? The context could tell you, but overall, for example, I am I am a scientific mystic. That's it. But sometimes I, I move around because science can only confirm the mystical and the contemplative can give you serenity. Science cannot give you serenity. I love these ideas of having this conversation with your body and your mind to remind you of things that you have already experienced to and you can do it in any context, not just intuition, of course, but in yes. any context. I, that's I think right. that's extremely powerful because you have all of that memory in your, in all those neurotransmitters in your brain, you have all that information, which of course is then stored in your gut and your heart as well. Yes. Because uh, the, uh, the mind is not in the brain. The mind is a hologram of the whole system of by information. And now, you know, because of all the neurons and, and the gut and, and the heart and the brain. And so we, we learn, we function as a, as a whole, as a bioinformational hologram. It's the best way to, that I can describe it. Do you think that scientifically we're going to be making some big leaps in consciousness regarding intuition, along with the longevity? Uh, and you should send me all of your tips on longevity. Well, I'm going to take your <laughs> class on the shift. Yes. Sure. And, and the course, yes. But well, yes, uh, the the uh, the Navy is doing research and there's some universities that are doing research. Some of it is being done by spies and all which is not really good, but then you can turn it into something very good. So there's, I would say in the last 10 years, science has begun to see intuition as something that can be studied empirically and that can be developed. So it's good news. It's very good news and great news for all of our listeners and these wonderful tips that you've offered to them as well. I just want to thank you so much for joining us today here. It's been a pleasure talking to you and learning more about insight and our cultural connection to our consciousness. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And, and, uh, Congratulations on your work also. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. Thank you so much. And many, many more delicious research um, coming from you as well. I look forward to learning all about it. Thank you.